สิ้นตาตะสันทินเวสะฟาเฟจิจิเชจงสันทินจันเมียวฟาลุนเจ้าตาวโหมันรู้ฮะเลี้ยวสันทอสลีคูตะละโลจันหูสันเวลตาสังกาวิกฤตวิชิวเอาโอ้คอมเพชั่น for the sake of this assembly and all living beings present the wonderful Nama Will to teach us how to live suffering and a t t e m p l e s and e m p e r and death and quickly realize n o n b u r t n a m u t a s a Bhagavato Arahato Sama s a m p u d a s a Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo s a d a n t o s u c h e d o y e p r a v a d i s a n m y a o s a n t o s h e Okay, let's recite together. Wu shan 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 wei miao fa, ai qian wan jie nan zao yu. Wo jin jian wan he shou shi, yuan jie ru lai chen shi yi. I'll give you a line. You give it back. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in a million eons. But now we see and hear it, and accept it reverently. May we truly understand. The Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, welcome to our sutra lecture. Nice to see you all. We're here in Gold Coast Dharma Realm Monastery here in Queensland, and there are six of us, seven of us, including myself, and limitless Buddhas uh, here gathered. So we have almost as many here live as you have there in Berkeley, uh, virtual. So uh, more folks are coming in. Good, good. All right, so I've got uh, Sam and Richard and Cliff, and Alyssa, and Tracy, and Karina here, and the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So um, while you all get settled, uh, I want to say that for us this is Sunday, February 26th. For you, it's Saturday night, February 25th. Those of you who will be watching on YouTube, it is a timeless space. Uh, it is the ten directions and the three periods of time all at once. So YouTube, when we're watching uh, on an archive, it, it's a very wonderful space. It becomes the eternally dwelling Dharma right there for us. We've got a, an important part of the text tonight to look at, and I'm I'm really excited about uh, this lecture tonight because I've run into two words in our text that I can't translate. And it's uh, I can make some guesses about what these words might mean, but I'm counting on everybody to help me out. I'm counting on this being a uh, a group effort at making sense of this lecture. So that's kind of rare. I haven't done that before, where I've uh, up front said I don't know what this means. Now I've checked commentaries. Uh, so I'm hoping that uh, Jin Chuan Shi will also help me. And if we have anybody who can handle C Beta, if there's anybody there who would like to check the h u a n Su Chao, which I don't have access to at the moment, that would be terrific. So uh, we'll I'll tell you when we get there. And this is an ongoing project. Um, we're all still getting settled in there. It's an ongoing project. Um, In uh, in understanding the seventh ground, because why 
this is a high state. This is a bodhisattva state who is about to become, the words that we have, he's about to become a wizard, I guess. He's about to become a magician. And the associations we make with those terms don't measure up to the bodhisattva state. Bodhisattva is, uh, you know, do we know what a wizard is? Well, popular culture does. Do we know what a magician does? Mm, roughly, because our fairy tales from childhood have talked about magicians. The bodhisattva is about to disappear. And yet, the sutra tells us uh, exactly how he does that and the decisions and choices he makes along the way. That's why this is so exciting. And the terms that are used to describe this process of transformation are uh, not, not clear to me. They go, the dimensions of what two of these terms mean um, go past my understanding. So I'm going to own that. And our commentary, Master Hua's commentary, I have uh, help from our published, this is the BTTS published Hua Yanjing, this is a new edition of the Hua Yanjing Qian Shi. So we're going to look at that. And if somebody wouldn't mind, uh, if you've got the Huayan Su Chao available to you, to look up Master Cheng Guan, Master Ching Liang, that will also give us some help. Maybe, uh, maybe there's somebody online who's got that and could type it in. Um, but, but wait till I tell you the line we're looking for. So a little bit, a little bit more research and detective work has to go in before um, I can give you my best guess at what this state is. Okay, so I hope that's interesting. Um, there's something wonderful happening to the seventh ground bodhisattva tonight. Now, before we get there, here is our, people can't see who are sitting here in the room with me. This is our title of the sutra. Namo Dafang Guang Fo Hai Yan Ding Hai Yan Hai Hui Fo Pu Sa. We're going to chant that and we, the idea is we're invoking we're inviting in the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas of the Avatamsaka Assembly of all time and space and asking for their aid in helping us understand this text. Here we go. <laughs> Who's keeping track that those two those two lines, Namo Dafang Wang Fo Hua Jing, and then Hua Yan Hai Wei Fo Pu Sa are the two lines that myself and Marty, Professor Verhoeven, chanted while we were bowing on our pilgrimage for two years and a half. So with every bow, we chanted that that those sounds were in our consciousness uh, for eight hours a day while we were bowing. So we, uh, those are familiar sounds uh, to me, certainly. Um, okay, I'm told by our tech team that people are joining us from Southern California, from Montreal, Indonesia, and from China. Lovely. And I believe from New York City and other places. Great. Now, our text is here. This is a provisional translation. You all 
sitting there in Berkeley don't have it yet, you're going to have to depend upon my screen here. Um, we've been moving a little quickly, a little more quickly than usual, so we've kind of outstripped our available text, but it begins with the Fords of the Pusa, Jutsu, DTD, Disciples of the Buddha, when the Bodhisattva stays upon this seventh ground. E N T H, add that word seven. It's provisional, so um, I'm going to make changes as we go. Be prepared for that. If you all want to uh, amend your text here, and, you know, as you read it, feel free to do that. Okay, I'm going to put my palms together for the Chinese and then the English. You all can join me if you like. I'll give you a line if you can. You give it back. Fu Zi, Fu Sa, Zhu Zi. Di Chi Di De Shen Shen Yuan Li Wu Xing Chang Xing Or better yet, let me say Wu Heng Chang Heng Shen Yu Yi Ye Qin Qiu Shang Dao Ar Bu She Li Shi Gu Fu Sa Okay, very good. Excellent. Now, we're going to do it again with the English. And let's do this together. Now, we'll read it together. We're going to do this in unison. Can, uh, can everybody in Berkeley see the screen? Is that okay? Uh, Jerry, is that a yes? Can everybody see the screen? Yes, it's very clear. Great. All right. Thanks. Here we go. Ready together? Disciples of the Buddha, when the Bodhisattva stays upon this seventh ground, he gets karma of body, speech, and mind that goes far beyond, quote, constant practice that seems like no practice at all. Do you all have that in your page? You don't have that? Okay. Uh, I'll read for the benefit of those there. Ready? He never abandons his diligent search for the highest way. Therefore, although the Bodhisattva travels to the limits of reality, he still does not realize that state. Let me see what you've got here. Okay, yeah, it was this, par this paragraph here. Okay. So you do have it. Okay, there we go. What's going on? Um, let me unpack this. Let's see if we can make sense of it, and I'll tell you right now, in advance, the phrase that I don't understand is this phrase right here. Although the Bodhisattva travels to the limits of reality, he still does not realize that state. Okay, let me unpack it for those of you who need to know some context, what's going on here. This is a textbook. It's a sutra. It's a religious scripture. Words the Buddha spoke. Things the Buddha wanted us to know. But it's an instruction manual. Just as much as when you get your new camera, uh, it says, you know, uh, oper uh, instructions for operating your new Sony, Nikon, Canon, Olympus, Fuji, Panasonic, number FGX. You know, and you open it up and it says, you know, installing the battery. And it says, put a memory card in this slot. It's an instruction manual. Who is being taught is a bodhisattva. Who's a bodhisattva? It could be any one of us. It could be you. It could be me. It could be someone in our future as you develop your spirituality. Um, it's a generic bodhisattva. It's anybody who wants to do what bodhisattvas do. Here's how. Okay, that's what this text is. It's a lot, we've been comparing it to things like chemistry textbooks. Okay, suppose you, for some reason, need chemistry. Let's say you want to be a doctor. So you're in pre med, right? Preparation, pre medical. Suppose you want to be a dentist and you're in you're going into pre dentistry. You need chemistry. So chemistry, I don't know how it's taught these days, maybe it's taught online textbooks or something or digitally, but 
back in my high school experience and college experience, you got a very thick chemistry text and it broke down everything that a chemistry student needed to know. And the Avatamsaka Sutra that we're looking at right now is very much like that. It's an instruction manual for somebody who wants to um, live the way a bodhisattva lives, think the way a bodhisattva thinks, and talk the way a bodhisattva talks. Okay, so that's what we're explaining. Now, when I say it, the reason why I'm making a fuss over this is because that's not what I think about when I think of the Holy Bible, for example, which is what another religious text that people when I was growing up were familiar with. Here's the Bible, Hebrew scriptures, the Gospels, Old Testament, New Testament, right? It's all the books. You think of that as somehow sacred. It's nothing that you, it, it's a God telling you about things that, that you otherwise wouldn't know about, right? Well, there is a piece, there are parts of the Avatamsaka Sutra that certainly give you the feeling of holy writ, but the way I'm understanding the Avatamsaka Sutra, it's much, much more like the grease-stained, bent cover, kind of gritty pages of a book that's telling you how to, re how to do a valve job on your Volkswagen. It's much more like that. It's a handbook. It's much more like what a book of maps. That's probably a better analogy. Somewhere in your car, you may have a book of maps for all of San Francisco or East Bay or California. Maybe you went to AAA, the American Auto the Australian Automobile Association, right? Do you have a AAA in Australia? AAA. Nobody knows how popular. Hey, there's a monetary opportunity. To start one, right? In California, we have the AAA, American Automobile Association, and there they provide all kinds of services. But what they're most most everybody knows them for their maps. Now, we, ever since GPS, maps have been a losing proposition. People don't do paper maps much, but um, we used to have a big, thick book of maps of every city in California, put out who was the publisher of the map book, big, thick map book. And it's true for Kuala Lumpur, Hong Kong, you need a map, okay? Well, that map is the kind of thing that you t twist it, you fold it, you bend it, you, you know, so it doesn't blow away in the air conditioner in the car. And the sutra is a lot like that. It's to be used. It's a book that tells you what's coming next. And okay, so far so good. Our bodhisattva is, because this, this particular sutra called the Flower Garden Sutra is primarily about training bodhisattvas. There are other things in here for sure, but that's what it's mostly about. Lotus Sutra, different. Lotus Sutra talks about Buddhahood. Sharangama Sutra is different. It talks about samadhi, how about meditation states and their function. This one is about the bodhisattva path. And so who's a bodhisattva? It's somebody who wants to maximize their potential for goodness. They want to bring what's inside of them to its highest quality of Virtue, kindness, compassion, wisdom. Okay, and you have to be an optimist. It's hard to be depressed and to keep going on the bodhisattva path. Although bringing forth the puti shin, the bodhi resolve, could counteract depression. That's we'll talk about that another time. So okay, that's what a bodhisattva is. Here's the book that tells him how to progress. Now. The path, the, the road, the map that the Avatamsaka shows us is pretty, is pretty vertical. I mean, you go from one to two, and from two to three, and three to four, up to ten. Now, there are people who go from one to six, maybe, or from three to seven, but by and large, it's a linear progression. So you, it's a, think about it as a road. It's, it's a trail out to the waterfall, you know, and when you walk this path to its end, Buddhahood is there. Um, so to give it another uh, 
reading, another another compass heading. Master Hua told us about ten Dharma realms. We called it Shifa Jie, the ten Dharma realms. And this is what this is the Buddhist view of the cosmos, how the world is made. We we heard these are a lot of technical terms, but stick with me because this will make sense. There is supposed to be three paths of suffering of the ten Dharma realms. Three of the Dharma realms are involved with with a lot of extreme misery, less misery, and some misery. The hells described in Buddhism is real. A lot of suffering there. There's a level of ghosts, yep, ghost level, lots of misery. There's a level of animals, which from the point of view of lifespan, from the point of view of if you're born as a chicken in a battery farm, in an egg farm, suffering. Okay, three evil destinies. Three not so bad, wholesome destinies. Humans, where we are now, kind of half and half, suffering and joy. Asuras, like titans, if you read your Greek mythology. And then the devas, the gods, in the plural. So, of which there's a lot of physical pleasure and comfort. So what do we have? Three evil destinies, three wholesome destinies. That's called the six-spoked wheel of rebirth. The six paths, Liu Dao Dunhui in Chinese. And that's where what, who lives there? Mortals, we people who have birth and death. That's samsara. Okay, still with me? These all these Buddhist terminology. So mostly people who don't think about questions like, is it possible to change my life? Can I improve my life? Just the whole quality of my life. Can I change my horizon? People who don't think about that pretty much stay right there in the six paths. And Master Hua described it as kind of like musical chairs. The music stops, you all rush for the chairs. You wind up in a different chair every time. Sometimes you're a deva, then you fall. You're a human. You don't do well as a human. You can lose your human body. Come back, go on up to the heavens and around. But that's samsara. That's the, the continuity of birth and rebirth. All right, there's four more in the ten Dharma realms. And what are they? Well, it's four, you could say rebirths, but they're more than rebirths. Four places you can find yourself alive that are beyond birth and death, beyond death and rebirth, samsara. They're what? Arhats, or voice hearers, shravakas, solitary Buddhas, bodhisattvas, and Buddhas. So those are called the Si Sheng, the four sages, rebirths. Okay, that's all the different ways that we can be, we can take life according to the Buddha. Okay, there's a Buddhist view. Okay, Bodhisattvas are number nine, ninth level. So if you find yourself as a Bodhisattva, you're almost a Buddha. And your wisdom and your compassion and your blessings go beyond the other two. The solitary Buddhas, they're called Pracheka Buddhas, and the sound hearers, the voice hearers. Okay, so there is a way to look at, these are bodhisattvas. In terms of ways to be alive, they're pretty much at the top of incarnation. But it's, that's not the way to think about it because you don't get born a bodhisattva. You cultivate to being a bodhisattva. It's work. It's choices you make and effort you make. Okay. Disciples of the Buddha. When the bodhisattva stays on the seventh ground, the seventh out of ten, right? Ten grounds. So this is not only is it the ninth Dharma realm, this is the seventh out of ten places to cultivate towards. This bodhisattva, the verb here is de, gets, obtains, owns, masters, karma of body, speech, and mind. Translate, when the Bodhisattva is here on the seventh ground, the words he or she says, the things he or she does, the thoughts that he, and he or she think, that's the karma of body, speech, and mind. This Bodhisattva can operate at a level that goes way beyond, quote, 
Now, what in the world? Constant practice that seems like no practice at all. How's that for a funky translation? It's not very elegant, right? But it's English. We kind of get that. It seems to the bodhisattva like no practice at all. Okay, illustrate. Well, um, I've used this story before. We were, it was, the year was 1980. We were in the city of 10,000 Buddhas. It was a cold winter. And we were meditating together. It was the winter Chan retreat at CTTV. Um, my um, pilgrimage was over, and I was there um, in the winter. And the, at the, those times, we, we didn't do um, multiple... We didn't do three weeks of Chan. We did one seven-day Chan retreat. We did a week of... Is that... I don't recall whether that's the case or not. We did one week of Amitabha, and then we did either one week of Chan or more. I believe it was one week. And... Uh, it was like day number four, and people were, 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 were meditating or were kind of, you know, enduring a lot of pain. It was really cold out, and you just, you're kind of huddled in there trying to stay warm. You're trying to hold on to your full lotus without dropping your legs down because your knees are burning. And it's just after lunch, and you know you've got another... <sighs> another 23 hours until you get to eat again and you know you're going to be what are you laughing at but you, you know that you're going to be uh, sitting there until midnight right and it's now like 1 p.m. your stomach's full and you're having this kind of you know high blood sugar low blood sugar and and so the door slams open and in stomps cheerful master Hua stomps in He's got his chi up, and he walks around staring at everybody. And of course, you're like, and Shurfu goes by you, and you're like, yeah, I'm working hard, Shurfu. You know, and he goes by, and he goes, hm. Oh, you know, you're in for it now. He's like, hm. Here comes the scolding. And he says, Do you all know? He says, and I'll spare you the, the effect, but he goes, do you all know that I am always, always reciting the Buddha's name? And I'm not like you, I don't casually recite and then forget. I know exactly how many names I've recited every minute. Did you know that? We're going, no, sure we <laughs> he walks around. And then we're going, huh, it's the amazing, you know, because my rec recitation is inconstant. I'm on it, and I forget it, and I'm on it, forget it. And then he says, hmm, did you all know that I am always, always reciting mantras? I am never not reciting a mantra. And I'm not like you. I know exactly how many mantras I've recited. And I know where I am in my mantra, long or short. Did you know that? I'm never not reciting. Uh, Shurfu, you just said that you were reciting the Buddha's name. And, but, uh, but, you know, hmm, he says, name, I'm not. What are we hearing? You know, what's he telling us? He goes, did you know? Huh? He says, I am always, constantly, always reciting sutras. And I never forget. I always know what page I'm on, what line I'm on. I'm never not reciting sutras. Huh? You can't even stay awake. Huh? Slams the door and walks out. Right? We're like, oh. <laughs> Sitting straight up. I, you know. And so, <clears throat> now... You got by my presentation that part of part of what Shriver was doing was giving us support, right? Because why? After lunch on a, a long chan sit, you're you're really easy to fall asleep. Pretty drowsy. Your stomach's full of food and blood's gone down. You know, but that's on one hand. So he was like stirring us up, trying to give us more vigor. This is what a good teacher, a chan teacher, does. But more than that, the content of what he said, one thing you can do is dismiss it. Oh, you know, what did he mean by that? You know, oh, Sheriff was just saying that. You can do that. You can dismiss it. But what's the point of that? The way I heard it at, at the time, beyond its kind of, you know, startling you awake factor, was Sheriff was giving us a clue about 
the mind of someone who is in samadhi, which is multi-tracking. And that's not a state I can imagine. But when he says something, he wouldn't say it only for shock effect. If he said it, he meant it. And yet, if you have a conversation with Sherpa, he's totally focused on you. He's answering. He's clearer than you are about why you're saying it and the way to solve the question you're asking. He's boom. He's like super focused. So what in the world is going on with someone like that? And my guess is the mind has capacities that we don't understand. And he got to wherever that state is through his own cultivation. So when I hear the sutra say, this bodhisattva's body, mouth, and mind karma goes far beyond, quote, constant practice that seems like no practice at all. Maybe that's something like what Shriver was describing to us. I don't know. I'm guessing. But I have, at some point in my I did a period when I was reciting 108 great compassion mantras a day. And I made a vow that I would do that. And the great compassion mantra has 96 lines? 87. 87 lines. Anybody want to check? Jin Chuan, put you on the spot. How many lines in the Dave Jo? Oh, he grabbed for the mic. He said... He didn't know. Wow, anti-climax. Who's got a yellow book? Qin Shen, you're closest to the book rack there. Grab a yellow book. 87. My guess is 87. Anybody else know? I've seen... Da Bei Zhou, Dou Shao Jesus. However, I've seen different numbers in different places, I have to say. Oh, come on. Scholars, scholars. <laughs> That's a dodge. The Da Bei Zhou, the only one and true real Da Bei Zhou has. Sam has got it. Quickly. You're going to beat Shin Shen. Oh, it's 80. Oh. Thank you, thank you. You can, Shin Shen, you can confirm. 87, right? Basha Chi Ju. Okay. This is the Tian Di Ling Wen. There we go. 87 lines. The last one of which is Sopo He. Okay. Good chance. That's true. Sopo He. All right. To recite the Great Compassion Mantra at a speed that uh, is still legible. If you go, uh, I, I won't try to, I'm not going to pose a speed, but I know there are some people who recite it in a blur. You know, they recite it so fast that you can't understand a word. I don't think that's legit. I think mantras should be uh, understandable. At least the syllables should be, now maybe it actually downshifts into fifth gear overdrive. But in my experience, uh, it's faster than the fish. When I recite inside, let's say if you're reciting it together with a group, you can go pretty fast with a wooden fish, especially if it's got a nice rubber bonger there that's a bouncy. Um, but when I recite inside, I go faster than that, but it's still every syllable. I don't go beyond the syllables getting mushy, right? Too fast to be a blur. So if I do it that way, it's about uh, 90 seconds to recite 87 line mantra. Just about, usually. So when I was doing 108 a day, back to my vow, right? 108 mantras a day, 90 seconds of mantra. If I did nothing but recite, just knelt in front of the Buddha or walked in a circle or sat in full lotus and recited, that meant I was about two and a half hours, roughly, to do 108 mantras. And somebody can do the math and say, that's not correct. But it took me, on the average, two and a half hours. And, of course, rarely do you have two and a half hours of uninterrupted time, right? People come up to you, you have to, uh, if you're driving a car, you have to pay attention to the the things that are happening on all sides. And if you're, you know, in the monastery, phone rings, you 
two things. So how do you how do you do it? Well, what I discovered was that with all of those issues, um, often I would get to like 9 p.m. at night and I would have 20 mantras to go. You know, I would get to pretty much the end of my day when I wanted to sleep and I still had a handful of mantras. Um, I, the two and a half hours straight through got stretched out through the day. And many's the night that I would like fall asleep with my head down on the altar, my hands on my beads, with, you know, I'd wake up like at 2 a.m. and I had 15 mantras left. Oh, no. You have to figure out, does the Buddha care if it's like two hours into the next day? Does that still count for your vow? So my point is to say that over time, because of the pressure of giving myself, saying, I want to recite 108 mantras a day, things happened to my recitation. And I, I did that vow for, I think, about five years. And then I said, I'm going to stop trying to do 108 because I became a graduate student. And I couldn't, uh, I could have knocked it down to 49, for example, or 21, and make it a vow. But what happened that allowed me to do that was I found myself reciting the best analogy for it is the way water goes over rock. Something happened inside to my reciting that made it, another way to talk about it is kind of like autopilot. And yet I still had a sense of sopoho, namoho, ladano, you know, ending and beginning. It wasn't a mush. It was still, I didn't have a number for it. I'd given up 108 but the mantra continued and for one thing I really liked the mantra sound and two I liked what the mantra did to my inner processes my breathing and my heartbeat I found that having the mantra as a kind of I must say a theme song having a mantra as a track in my mind gave the normal activities of the day a very nice uh, new heartbeat and it wasn't a bump 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 it wasn't that kind of heartbeat it was uh, a it was modeled on the phrases of the mantra you know the the name of Guan Yin and all those different because the Guan Yin the great compassion mantra is based on Guan Yin Bodhisattva so I kind of felt that it was a way of Guan Yin Bodhisattva making herself himself home in my heart and it was the the most important thing was that I could check am I still reciting and the funny thing that it felt like was if you've ever like spun a top if they do tops I know in China they have tops you wrap it with string and you throw it and the top spins uh, yeah okay and if, if you're good at it, you can like take the string and hit it again, and it, it continues to spin. I, I had an, a way of like touching the mantra with consciousness and making you know keeping it spinning, tuning in on the mantra, so I could keep it going uh, during the day. And that's the only thing that I can bring that would relate to constant practice that seems like no practice at all. Now, for the Bodhisattva on the seventh ground, this is all the time, and it's body, mouth, and mind. So you look at this Bodhisattva, and they seem what they seem very mellow, I'm sure. They don't get angry, they don't get pissed off, they don't get upset. You know. And they seem very humble, very kind, and yet inside, you have to know that there's more going on. The bodhisattva is uh, cultivating all the time the body, mouth, and mind. Transferring merit, for example, or praying. What do we say? Praying for somebody all the time. We uh, would sit beside Master Hua when he was lecturing, and he would lecture every single night, every single night. And as a translator, I would get to sit beside 
right beside Shurfu down below and watch him. And as he was, you know, explaining the text, I'm busily writing down my notes because I'm going to be saying them back in a minute. But as I was, when he was done, and it was my turn to present what I heard him say, uh, Shurfu would be sitting there, and you could see that he was just, it was, gosh, you know, what was he doing? The answer is, I don't know, but judging by what I saw from outside, it was as if Shurfu was like shifting gears back into something like wheels turning. And like the wheels were turning, like the top was spinning. And he would be, you know, doing things. And sometimes he would have mudras going. And then I would finish. And if he was not done yet, there would be this gap. And he'd be going, Bani hala you know, y'all done? And I'd say, Bani hala shiva. Okay. And then he would go back, you know. So it seemed like no practice at all, but you just had the feeling that Shurfu was, you know, doing his work, whatever that was. And so that's kind of what makes sense to me here, that the Bodhisattva is practicing all the time, but he doesn't make a show of it. There's nothing to see. Certainly he's not advertising that he's a big cultivator, you know. It's not practicing for show. Okay, next line. Qin Chou Shang Dao Er Bu Shodi. What does he do? He never abandons his diligent search for the highest way. Okay, Qin Chou, he's always seeking Shang Dao, the Supreme Dao. What would that be? Buddhahood. So he's got his goal of, I want to be a Buddha. I will become a Buddha. And Arbu Shodi, he never lets that go. She never lets that go. All this time. You know, all the hours, weeks, days, months, years, lifetimes of this practice, still on his Bodhi resolve. Okay, next line. Everybody help me out. So we're going to go to notes here. I can bring up my note page. Right, open up a new page. Okay, there it is. Now let's look at these lines. This bodhisattva. What is shiji, and what does it mean to sotra? Those are the two. Okay. The the common easiest translation would be reality limit boundary. Shi is happen to be my name for one thing, real, and real extends to reality. Shi Ji Xing in in Mandarin is like well, in reality, as opposed to fantasy, as opposed to a dreamlike state, as opposed to um, like a drug induced trance. You know, let's say you're drunk. That's not Shi Ji Xing. Reality is kind of like, you know. Uh, here, the reason, one of the reasons why this is so hard is, even in a single language, getting people to agree what is reality is a challenge. So what's reality? Well, everybody knows what reality is, dude, you know. What about reality? So reality, when you poke into it, you realize reality is a very slippery concept. Do you, like Sam is sitting here on my right, you know, what is Sam's reality? Is it the same as mine? I will never know. You have no way to know because a reality would be something like the sum total of that person's conscious state, um, emotional state, you know, sense input state, sense sense reality. All those different things make up what we call reality. And of course, this is the realm of philosophers. And you would probably if you, if I knew the state of all the seven people in the room right this minute, uh, eight people, chances are no two would have anything we could agree on. We call reality, right? It's just so uh, so amorphous a concept. And if it's reality, you can't know the limit of it because reality includes you. So can you step outside yourself to see? 
what your reality is. It's kind of like that that funny conundrum where you say, you know, I'm going to wake up faster to catch myself when I'm asleep. I really want to see what I look like when I'm asleep, so I have to wake up faster. So you push yourself to wake up faster. Oh, darn it, it wasn't fast enough, I'm already awake. Right? So, by definition, that's a contradiction. If you wake up, you're no longer asleep. It's kind of like saying, what, I'm going to cut the handle of this knife with its own blade. And if it's a straight knife, no matter how you twist it, you're never going to be able to cut the handle of the knife you're holding. Now you think, oh, it's a pocket knife. You fold it. Yeah, well, that's not what I'm talking about. So those are obvious, you know, contradictions. Those are, you're never going to work that out. I'm never going to know my own reality because the words that I'm using to describe my state are part of that reality. So you can't take a part to describe a totality. You can infer it. You can use metaphor, you can draw a picture, you can talk about what it kind of is like, right? But you're never going to know the reality. Okay, this word, qi, qi bian, qi, is that a fourth tone? Di si shang ha, qi, shi ji ba. Shi ji. Qi, fourth tone, okay. Boundary. So limits of reality. What happens here? Sui Xing Shi Qi. Although this Bodhisattva, the word is Xing, travels, walks along, mm, journeys to. Is it that he gets to it? Is it like a fence? Or does he like skirt the outskirts of reality? Is it like somebody who is skateboarding? along the dike, and this side is the ocean, this side is the dry land, and he's like flirting with falling into the ocean? Is that Xing Shi Ji? That's where I'm stuck. It says, although, Suiran, although the Bodhisattva travels to or along or in the limits of reality, right? See my difficulty here? This this construct in the grammatical construct, sui or although still. That's how this, the sentence is built. Although this, this. Okay. Although the bodhisattva travels to the limits of reality, however, he does not. Where's my new page here? He does not make certification realize certify prove make proof right like that so question is what does it mean to zuo zhang he doesn't certify he doesn't he doesn't realize that state. Okay, what's going on here? Okay, let me put it into context, and then I'm going to ask for help. Um, Shurfu would often say to us, Master Hua, um, when you get enlightened, you have to be certified by somebody who is already enlightened before it counts. He would say that. Why would he say that? Well, when he got to San Francisco in 1962, um, and then he began to teach in public uh, among Westerners in San Francisco in 1967-68, he met a lot of people who proclaimed themselves already enlightened. He met lots of self-enlightened, homemade, do-it-yourself American patriarchs, right? Oh, I'm a Buddha. You didn't know that? Yeah, everybody's a Buddha. We're all Buddhas, people would say. And there we know their name. These are these are famous stories of Master Hua's early time in San Francisco. And Shurfu would say, Oh, okay, well, and he would test them out. Uh, there was one guy in particular, Joe Miller, who was a famous uh, this is the days of Hippie Town in San Francisco, Hit Ashbury, and and uh, 
Joe Miller was a, you know, these are well-meaning spiritual folks who had never met the real thing. Master Hua was the real thing. And Sheriff would say, oh, okay, uh, here it's it. You know, uh, when somebody really uh, is enlightened, when they're real Buddhists, they don't care about their bodies and lives. And Master Hua pulled out a sword. He had this, you know, this huge Chinese sword. And he said, now, he said, I'm going to come over, I'm going to cut your head off. And if you move, clearly you're not enlightened. And he goes, what are you doing? Master Hua's this big, scary guy. And the guy, you know, backed up, stood up, ran out of the door. Oh, not yet. You know, I'll talk. See you later. See you next week. I won't be there. Committed. You know, oh, sure. But I guess he still has some attachments to something. You know, maybe his own body and mind. So he w that was pretty dramatic. But he would, he would teach, test people out who would make these claims to be, to be Buddhas and enlightened. And then he would say to us, you know, not kidding, he would say, you can't certify yourself. Uh, those who have gone through, he would say, know those who have gone through. Okay, and when you, he would say, a third stage bodhisattva doesn't know the state of the fourth stage bodhisattva. The fourth stage bodhisattva is unaware of the state of the fifth stage bodhisattva. And it's really like that. So what do we have to compare with it? If you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide, you're a good math student, uh, comes along a mathematician who's doing differential calculus, right? And the third grader who's learned really well how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide doesn't have a clue about differential calculus. The calculus person can do what the third grader can do. The third grader hasn't a clue about what higher levels of mathematics. So he would say, you have to be certified by somebody who knows the state before you can claim to be enlightened. Um, and if you look back at the Buddhist stories of the Buddhist life, he would always, you know, there were lots of stories of people who would say, indeed, you know, the Sixth Patriarch is an example in the Sutra. He wakes up and then certifies dozens of men and women. Okay, what do you make of that? What do you make of that? One thing is these, these levels that we're talking about, stages of the Bodhisattva path, are real things. They're real qualifications. Um, somebody with a BA does not have an MA, a master's degree. Somebody with a master's degree does not have a doctoral degree. Okay, that makes sense. But what does it mean in this case? Here's the bodhisattva who, when he practices, seems like he's not doing it. Two, he never runs out of gas for the motive for his practice, never gets bored, never gets dis distracted, never burns out. And this one, the bodhisattva is right at the point of going beyond what is possible, but he doesn't want to stop there. He doesn't want to own it. He doesn't want to cash in. Make sense? Don't know. Take a look here. Next one. Okay, ready? Muna Liberation Bodhisattva said, Disciples of the Buddha, from which ground can the Bodhisattva enter the Samadhi of Cessation? Mia Ding. All right. Oh boy. What is the Mia Ding? What is the Samadhi of Cessation? Jin Chuan, do you have the microphone there? Were you about to say something? I, was, I don't know if you want uh, some, some thoughts Please for do. that last, yeah, yeah, yeah. last sentence. Since you brought okay, it up, I've it. been spending the, the lecture looking at the Sanskrit. And mm. it's actually very interesting what it says. It says, uh, essentially, because the Bodhisattva constantly practices the highest path, uh, he comes to reach... Uh, comes to, you could say, almost like reach like the edge, reach, arrive at cessation, niroda. But he has not realized it personally. He has not realized niroda personally. He has not seen it for himself. So 
I can see it's the Bodhisattva is constantly practicing this, pra it's this kind of what you said, the constant practice without practice at all. Um, and he's getting to very close to this, this actual real awakening, which is the eighth ground, it seems. But he's not quite there yet. But he's, he's just at the edge. You know, he's right there. He's at just with this practice, he's just right there, right next to it. And then he hasn't realized it. He actually hasn't seen it for himself. Okay, good. That's very helpful. So here's the thing that, that I'm, as I was preparing this text today, I said to myself, the Bodhisattva is, a, he's doing what in the worldly definition would be is magic. This Bodhisattva can disappear. Into what? Into Nirvana. But he doesn't. Now, what is Nirvana? And our studies tell us there's multiple kinds of nirvana. There's not one kind of nirvana. And nirvana, that leaving of continuity, getting out of samsara, is essentially a series of samadhis, samadhi states. What are samadhi states? They're meditation states. Right? You get so quiet, you get so still, that transformations happen in your body and your mind and your consciousness. Um, to know more about this, where do you go? Sharangama Sutra. We mentioned that earlier. The Sharangama Sutra is full of, especially the 50 Skanda demon states at the very, very end, is full of descriptions of these amazing, astonishing states of meditation you can get into where you suddenly see universes coming into being, universes passing away. You see limitless living beings going through their stages of birth, old age, sickness, death, rebirth, old age, sickness, death, and you're still not there. You're not a Buddha yet. So it describes this in the Sharangama Sutra. So here our Bodhisattva is, like Jin Chuan Shu says, he's on the brink of leaving, but he doesn't. He stays in touch with living beings, and we're going to find out why. Okay, so that's why I took it. I did. I asked the question for help, and then I went on, went up, went on, because there is more um, evidence here for our research. What is it? Moon Liberation asks a question. He says, disciples of the Buddha, you in the audience and Vajra Treasury, how does the Bodhisattva get to the Samadhi of cessation? Which of the grounds is the entry into Nirvana where you don't come back? Okay, the Samadhi of cessation, the Mie Ding, it's right there in Chinese. Nang Ru Shama Mie Ding. Mie is a word which means wiped out, gone. Extinct, extinguished, like you extinguish a fire. That's mia, mia huo qi, right? You, which, at, from what ground? First ground up to sixth, seventh ground, where does the bodhisattva wipe his consciousness out of existence and not come back? In other words, quit the bodhisattva path. Notice, there's that whole side of it, which is from the, from the Bodhisattva's point of view, this is quitting. This is distinctly brand X. You don't want to quit. So we have all this evidence that the Bodhisattva is not quitting. What is he doing? He never abandons his diligent search for the highest way. Um, he's constantly remembering his vows, but he can reach to nirvana and he won't. So, how interesting. What kind of a state is this Bodhisattva in? So, from which ground can the Bodhisattva enter the Samadhi of cessation? Okay, so let's read the next part and then I want people to chime in and help me out here. Okay, here's the, um, here's the Chinese. Those of you can see. So, Jin Gang Zang Pu Sa Yan, Fu Zi Pu Sa Song Di Liu Di Lai, Nang Ru Mie Ding, Jin Zhu Si Di, Nang Nian Nian Ru Yi Nian Nian Qi Ar Bu Zhu Zhang 
，故此菩萨名为成就不可思议生于一夜，行于实际而不作证。Master Treasury Bodhisattva replied, "Disciples of the Buddha, once the Bodhisattva reaches the sixth ground, he or she can enter the samadhi of cessation. Whether he or she reaches this ground, he can enter it. Or when, sorry, when he or she reaches this ground, he can enter it in any successive thought, and can also leave the samadhi from any successive thought, and yet still does not realize the state. This is why this Bodhisattva bears the name." One who accomplishes inconceivable karma, the body, mouth, and mind, traveling to the limits of reality, but not realizing the state. Okay. Okay. So, we've. This is our science text. This is our instruction manual. The things I've mentioned before. What it's saying is, when you get to the sixth ground, where you discovered emptiness, in particular. Talked about the twelve links, right? People who remember who were here. This is essentially what you saw was how the world is created. You saw how everything comes into being: your body, the world, living beings, karma, suffering. You saw how it arises and how it goes away. And that vision was what it's a result of your meditation. Your meditation showed you that. So you're getting good at your meditation. You're really a good meditator, and you saw that. And what that does, it it there's enough of a change in your body and your mind at that point that you can choose to enter samadhi from there. Now, what um, what would we call it? You can die, right? You know, say that you could die. You could just go. They're gone. And our hearts do it. Our hearts go yippee! I'm out of suffering. Right, no more affliction. All right, Shifu, Master Shen Hua. I've got the commentary here. Uh, Shifu at this point says, on our uh, let's see, Pusa Zhu Zi Di Qi Di De Shen Shen Yuan Li Wu Hong, uh, Chang Xing Shen Yu Yi Ye Qin Xiao Shang Dao Er Bu Shuo Li Shi Gu Pusa, Sui Xing Shi Ji Er Bu Zuo Zhang. Shifu says um, the Bodhisattva who is right now cultivating on the seventh ground, when he's staying there on the seventh ground,、uh, gets to Dao Da Le Shen Wu Fen Liang Nan Yu Che Zhi De Jing De, gets to a state that is really hard to fathom. This is an amazing a state that's really beyond knowing. 以远离一切染污及过去所有的盖章 ，He gets rid of everything that obstructed him in the past. Nothing is left from what used to hold him back or her. Okay, 他经常所表现与生于一三夜的无一不是如重于千秋无上的佛道。Everything the Bodhisattva does with body, speech, and mind, without exception, moves him towards the Buddha's path. Er, from 不增少舍精进 and he never slows down, never fails in his vigor. So just that, you know, this is a special person, who's the the effort they use in their meditation at this point is no different than it was at the very beginning. Pusa 虽已确实证得了无相法门 even though the Bodhisattva has really and truly Jungda, certified, reached, realized, Wu Xiang Fama, unmarked, un, the the Dharma door of no distinctions. Shifu introduces that term, which we haven't seen in the sutra. What is the Wu Xiang Fama? So, in other words, the meditation that you do at this point, nobody can see that you're actually cultivating. You're sitting there, but all of your inner work is happening invisibly. So, 确实证得无相法门，但他并不自认已断烦恼。But this person would never say, "I put an end to all my afflictions," 或未断烦恼 ，or I have not yet put an end to all my afflictions. 而是在思量者之间 ，the Bodhisattva is right in between these two. You go, sure, well, that doesn't help. <laughs> What? 
The Bodhisattva would never say, I've cut off all my afflictions, or I haven't done it yet. He'd never make that claim of himself. He's right in between the two. Go, whoa. Yeah. So what is this? This is deep, deep stuff. Okay? And I that's why I think it's important to own that the sutra is just describing a reality of the bodhisattva. But for me to like try to get a clue, a handle on what this state must be like is really challenging. And yet it, it might as well be talking about how you feel when you jump into a swimming pool on a hot day. You know, it's still uh, a description of a reality, of a state. Okay, who's got a comment? Who's got a clue? What, what makes sense here? We will be happy to pass you the microphone. Qin Shen Shi, got his hand up. Excellent. Another thing I could say would be, help me out. Uh, so I, I think, um, just a guess still. So, um, like. Uh, this is Simon. Is that Simon? Yeah, this is Simon. So hi, just, Simon. Hi. Just a guess. Um, so like uh, Dharma Master talks about the great compassion mantra experience, and uh, I think also like um, sometimes like you can recite a mantra or like a Buddhist name. Um, you cannot. You in the beginning it's like driving. You kind of just watch like whether you're doing it right, and then once you know you're doing it right, then you probably will constantly like check to see whether you're still doing it right. But then if you really want to go to a state that your consciousness you're not active anymore, means that you're not really actively checking anymore, you have to give up that give up that. So once you give up that, it still doesn't mean that you actually enter into a state that you recite and not recite. Uh, because you I think you can only put your intention, like you can it's like either reciting Buddha's name or who is reciting Buddha's name. You can put your intention there, saying that, okay, I'm just going there. Um, sometimes you can, when your intention is right, you can kind of just go on track, go on the right track. But when you're on the right track, um, I think what happened at that moment is that you still have a root, because you can still come back from your reciting recitation state, a good recitation state. Maybe after an hour or two hours, you just come out. And then, uh, so... I kind of just try to like compare this to uh, a larger scale where, where like a Bodhisattva not just reciting Buddha's name only or not just reciting mantras only. He probably is doing like a multiple like samadhi like or like cultivation at the same time. And then one of it could be just the Diamond Sutra talks about like you, cr you, you practice the six you know while you don't have any marks of living beings. So in that case Living being, crossing over living beings, or marks of living being, or marks of crossing over living being, or marks of yourself crossing over living being, these can be uh, constantly checked as you're just reciting Buddha's name, you know. And then, but on a larger scale where you empty yourself out, so you're applying that to all like Dharma realm. And then, by the moment, I mean, I think it's just like driving. You're on the right highway, but you don't check yourself anymore, but still, you can, like, maybe make some mistakes. No, I mean, probably not mistakes, but you still have the root of not constantly going to that state, because once you go to a state, you just don't... Right. Yeah, okay, so that's my guess. Okay, yeah. okay, that's a good attempt. It's, the tendency is to want to, I mean, I'm with Simon, the tendency is to want to throw a lot of words at it, and this is not words. <laughs> Is is so? Uh, how do you respond? Like you mentioned the the Diamond Sutra, okay, the Vajra Sutra. So the Vajra Sutra is famous for its own self contradictions. It says the living the Bodhisattva takes every living being across, and there are no living beings who are taken across. You know, and you go boom boom like what? That's nonsense. No, it's not. It's beyond binary logic. 
it's beyond duality. And it's just the beginning. The, the Vajra Sutra is describing the kind of thing that happens at the sixth ground, where emptiness arises and you realize that everything that's going on is what, it's like what? The Vajra Sutra says, it's like a dream, it's like a dewdrop, it's like a flash of lightning, it's like an illusion, it's like a bubble. You know, contemplate all things made of conditions in this way. Because they seem to be real, and in fact, they're only there temporarily. So, okay, that's where we are. Now, having said that, it sounds like it's easy to just kind of, oh, it's like a, you know, an opium dream or something. It's not the Bodhisattva saving your mother from cancer. The Bodhisattva is pulling the bus out from the collision, you know, the bridge abutment. It's real stuff going on here, but this is a textbook of how the Bodhisattva prepares for this state. You know, so it's real. That's the thing. And I mean, the um, we're seeing it uh, at at the raw theoretical level. When you apply it, it's real people sitting in meditation while their knees burn and not wiggling. Because why? The bell hasn't rung yet. And they're determined to trans to, to subdue their false thinking. You know? So we had the advantage of a teacher who taught these texts from the seat of his pants. And he put them in front of us every night for 90 minutes and said, this is important. I want you all to understand this. He said, Shurfu held it up and said, can you all get this? this you know, do, do, you, do you see this? And he, he did it for 30 years. 30 years, every night, twice on the weekends, saying, this is important stuff. I'm doing this. If you want to join me, you're certainly welcome. It would be nice if you'd help translate. But it was clear that Master Hua valued the, the, the material in the sutras um, as his, the message he wanted to leave in America and in the world, essentially. Um, what I, I got inspired by this particular sutra, and when I wrote my dissertation, um, what I wrote about was called a practice-centered interpretation of the Avatamsaka Sutra. So the word xing, practice, and heng, practice verb, practice noun, xing heng, is really important. Because why? There are other interpretations of the Avatamsaka Sutra that don't do it this way. What do they say? Philosophy. They relegate this text to the realm of theory, you know, bull session. Oh, that's interesting. Cool. Oh, there are, the, there, it's the mutual interpenetration of phenomena and noumena, and the mutual interpenetration of phenomena and phenomena. And you go, Wake me up when it's over, because this is really boring. <laughs> and Master Hua did not do that. He said, this is, you know, bodhisattvas want your family's suffering to end. That's what they live for. They will stand in and take on all the suffering that you should experience, because why? They don't make a distinction between you and them. And how can they do that? Here's how. Their wisdom sees through suffering. And yet, at the same time, they are in the same body as you, Tongti Dabe, same body, great compassion. Do you understand? He would say. And, and then you would see Shurfu, you know, take on other people's misery and solve their problems. And you go, oh, he means it. This is, he's actually getting his, where is Shurfu getting his strength from? It had to be from sutras like this. So, anyway, practice centered. Compassion-centered, suffering-centered, not not philosophy. So cool. Okay, now more questions, more comments. Simon put his mind on this, thinking, "What could this mean?" Anybody here want to talk about what does it mean? Actually, uh, Chinchuan Shu's Sanskrit described the limits of reality as essentially nirvana. 
Niroda. Niroda is, is ending. That's the third noble truth. Suffering can end. Um, and so you could translate, the Bodhisattva gets right up next to Nirvana, but he doesn't enter Nirvana. You could translate it that way, essentially. He's going to continue, meaning keeps on suffering to the extent that Bodhisattvas suffer. And then Moon Liberation says, okay, at what point can he really do that? And the answer is sixth ground, from the sixth ground. And you can do it in thought after thought. The Bodhisattva could go to a place of no suffering instantly at any time, but he doesn't. And so we give him a name, and that name is somebody whose body, mouth, and mind, the habits, the words, the thoughts, the actions they do are inconceivable. You can't imagine that they're really doing it. They could realize nirvana, but they still don't. They could retire, but they go back to work. Okay, can we do one more? I know everybody's, this is like a lot. Let's, let's do one more paragraph, because why? We get a picture. The sutra is going to give us a picture. Here it is. Pi ru yo ren, cheng chuan ru hai, yi shan qiao li, bu zao shui nan, si di pu sa yi fu ru shi, cheng bo luo mi chuan, xing shi ji hai, yi yuan li gu, er bu zheng mie. He or she is like a mariner who travels on board ship into the ocean, and with skill and strength avoids all the disasters that can befall ocean travelers. Bodhisattvas on this ground are just the same. On the ship of the Paramitas, they travel the ocean of the limits of reality. Because of their vows, they don't realize nirvana, cessation. Okay, that's helpful. All right. Good. What's coming up? We get a list of ten coming up. Talk about the strength of the samadhi. And we get ten all those. Although the bodhisattva is this, still this happens. Although that, still that happens. And all of that is about what? It's about kindness and compassion. It's these bodhisattvas um, could quit and they don't. They go back into the, the pollution. They go back into the rain. They go back into the flooded waters and pull out people who thought their lives were over, but the Bodhisattva shows up, gets them on board, gets the dog and the cat and the goldfish and pulls them out of the flooded house and gets them back on the bank and, and into dry clothes. So, yeah. Any comments or questions? John, what do you think? John Foe, this sixth, seventh ground is awesome stuff. Yeah. Bodhisattva path. Okay. Um, any more comments, questions? Anybody online, Jerry, have comments or questions? Are we all kind of blitzed out by the Bodhisattva's selflessness? Dharma master. Um, yeah, that's Connie. I know. I is. was, I was thinking, how about like maybe um, the Bodhisattva does not settle in realization. Like he does not settle into realization. Yeah. Does not settle. That's good. For, I don't know. I was just throwing yeah, he doesn't, some words doesn't, out there. Okay. That's helpful. Yeah. Meaning, doesn't like kind of quit. You know, it's like, oh well, this is a comfortable armchair, and I've got some really good potato chips and a cold drink. So, who needs samsara? That's good. Yes. Doesn't settle in. Okay. Well, should there is also a question for online. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, I also type in the chat box. Uh, the question is, is okay. seven ground the ground if reversible for the Bodhisattva? Okay, so Peggy wants to know, is the seventh ground irreversibility? Nope, coming up, eighth ground. But it's right in between the seventh and eighth. Still ahead, so you have to keep listening. Okay, there's uh, there's something something coming soon that is that'll answer your question. 
and it's um, the that irreversible stage is called Bhutuijan, Abhivartika in Sanskrit. That's said to be after the Bodhi resolve, the single most important moment in a Bodhisattva's path. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, thanks for that question. Um, okay. Song of Enlightenment. We're going to do 10, 11, 12, 13. The 13th one works for certifying yourself. This is what? This is um, Shifu, Master Hua, said any day, any day that you can recite the Zheng Dao Ge from memory is a day when your afflictions will end. You'll have no more fun now on that day. So he did it every day. I haven't done the whole thing. I used to have it all memorized. Did it every day. I really liked uh, in 1986 in Vancouver at Gold Buddha Monastery. I had my little tape recorder, and Sherfu had finished lecturing, and he went up in the lobby near Waito Bodhisattva's statue there by the window, the old old Buddha and sat on the sofa and of course you know 20 people zoom, it's like iron filings to a magnet gathered around Sherpa and he just started to recite spontaneously the Jung Dao Ku song of the Lightning and uh, I recorded the whole thing and he he gave it he gave it all kinds of beautiful inflection as he sang and uh, made a big impression on me. So I have been translating it into English and trying to find the right musical setting for it. And recently I found a new setting which puts it into something that sounds like a generic uh, Christian hymn from the, the, the high and lonely mountains of the Appalachians. Kind of like a white roof, a white clapboard church. You'll hear it. And uh, here's the, this is how Shifu would do it in Chinese, and then how we're going to do it in, uh, in English. Let's see, right here. So, Changdu Xing, Changdu Gu, Da Je Tong Yo Nye Fang Lu, Biao Gu Sheng Xing Feng Zi Gao, Mao Cui Gu Gang Ren Gu Gu. Ever solitary, they always walk alone. Together with the ones who learn to take Nirvana's road. Their tune is old, their spirit's bright, their style is dignified. Their faces worn, their bones are steel, no one pays them any mind. The children of the Buddha live in poverty, they say. Their style is very basic, but they're wealthy in a way. They wear the clothes that no one wants. There's nothing left to patch. But in their hearts a treasure no millionaire can match. San Shan Si Zhi Ti Zhong Yan Ba Jie Liu Tong Xin Li Yin This treasure beyond price works in ways you can't devise. It helps things change, it makes things work, it's generous and kind. 
And bodies three in wisdom's four perfected right side. Freedom is eight, and power is six, seal the Buddha's mind. Okay, the last one goes. Shang Shi Yi Jie Yi Chie Liao Zhong Xia Duo Wen Duo Bu Xin Dan Zi Huai Zhong Jie Gu Yi Shui Nang Xiang Wai Kua Jing Jin The wisest people hear the Tao and everything discern. Fools and pedants laugh it off or doubt, the more they learn. So practice with humility, your laundry is not done. Be skeptical of those who claim to be the thus come one. So you can't certify yourself. Anyway, uh, 63 verses, can you believe it? Some night we're going to do them all 63. You'll be up just past midnight. Is he done yet? Will you switch and then turn it off? Oh. Song of Enlightenment. We're we're finding a home for it here in in the West. Did you finish it? What's that? Did you finish it? Chabadula. Yeah, I've got most of it. And there's like three or four that are stubborn. Three or four verses that just oh, don't. Is it on YouTube? Uh, no, not yet. <laughs> not, yet. not yet. Someday. Someday. This, this is the very beginning. You're hearing it for the first time. Okay. Uh, Jin Chuan Shri, you have any announcements, and then we'll do our transference. Jin, Jin Ho Shri, you got some announcements? Anybody? I think we have the uh, Guan Yin session coming up at the City of 10,000 Buddhas on March 11th to the 18th. Uh, we also, during that time, we're having the Living the Practice program from March 11th to April 1st for three weeks. What, describe what so, that is. So that's a, essentially, we start with a one-week Guan Yin session. Uh, Doug Powers a professor at DRBU and also uh, gives talks here at Berkeley Monastery. We'll be leading the first week on the Ten Grounds chapter. Actually, this, this chapter right here we're studying right now. He'll be using that as the basis for the, sutra, uh, for the session. And then following that, the second and third week, we'll be continuing to investigate the six paramitas and reading bio the biographies of Master Empty Cloud and Ajahn Mun. And the spirit is... Uh, or the, the program is essentially living living the life in the monastery of the Siddha Thousand Buddhas, the daily schedule of monastics, but in but adding on to that a study of a, a spiritual text like uh, the Six Paramitas and uh, the the lives of great Buddhist teachers. Um, other than Sounds that, good. here at Berkeley Monastery, I think we have our regular schedule. Is there a Buddhism for the Modern Mind next break, 27th? Yeah, so the Buddha for the Modern Mind is on break for till February 20th. No, you mean March? Oh, next month. Or so a whole month we won't be having class. I think because of the Guanyin Mind session. Three days, three days from now. No, no, March. March March happens in, March. Three, days. Happens in three days. Yes, February, February is done in three days. We only have three more days yes. in February left. Yes, so, but, so. The, but March 27th is when the next class will be for Buddha for Modern Mind. Okay. And uh, the, the rest, end of March. Yeah, the rest, the rest of our classes are continuing on as usual. Um, anything else? Um, okay. Steve, check if Stephen Tainer's class may or may not be happening this Wednesday. Yeah, that maybe check our okay. calendar. Okay. All right. Um, so folks know um, here at the Gold Coast Dharma Realm, we've announced a refuge and precept ceremony for April 29th. So the end of April, two months from now, if anybody wants to formally become a disciple of the Buddha or take precepts in advance in their commitment, then there's an opportunity to do that. Okay, we're looking forward to some rain coming in. It's been real dry here. California, we I think California got a lot of the moisture that was sucked up, they say, from down in Oceania, down here. That's the way those... They call it the Pineapple Express, this flowing river of water in the atmosphere that currently turned California 150% of normal rainfall fell this year. Um, and California is 26% of California is still in drought compared to 80% one month ago. So 
sixty percent of California that was suffering from catastrophic drought has now gotten a flood. So that's a good thing, but a little less there and a little more here would be appreciated. So. Okay, we're going to transfer the merit and then see you all next week. Thanks for joining. Here we go. If you have it there, in, uh, you can either watch it on the screen or if you've got it on your song sheet. Okay, here we go. May every living be of arms as one and radiant with life. Share the fruits of peace with hearts of goodness, luminous and bright. If people hear and see, our hands and hearts can find in giving unity. May our minds away to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave their grief and think. May this boundless light dispel the darkness of their endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into heaven. May all come compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. Okay, uh, would one of the monks lead the assembly in bowing? And we'll see you all next week. Bye bye, everybody. Respect to the Venerable Master.